to episode number 50 Garbors of Garbors This Time Machine. Wow, what a milestone. Can you believe we've reached that magic number, uh, episode 50? Silver is one of my favorite colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know the best part of that, Gar, neither one of us um, have any uh, gray or silver hair. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speak for yourself, I got it. Uh, you hide it well, my friend. Any <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, today we're going to be talking about, as always, one of our all-time favorite classic TV shows. This one, of course, um, I'll give you a little hint. What? When? Where? How? Of course I'm talking about, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, Cotter Gar. Welcome back, Connor. Oh my gosh! You know, I mean that it, back. You know, when that show came out uh, back in 1975. Yes, yes. Um, I was in my late teens, early twenties. You know that that part of my life. I uh, 1975 is is the year I, I graduated from high school. Oh wow! Um, so you know yeah, it. it, it the uh, appeal of the show, uh, the reason why the show was such a huge success at the time was because it had appealed uh, to my age group. Sure, sure. And, uh, you know, that was kind of a phenomenon for that time because most uh, TV shows, uh, you know, it, it was kind of like a, a new... Uh, not really much known about territory yeah. uh, for for the advertisers at that time. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because most most of the time, most advertisements were, uh, you know, geared towards, uh, you know, uh, Fam you know family people, oriented. Yeah. You know, people people in their mid twenties and older. You know, because that's what advertisers had deemed as the buying public. It's more family-oriented. You know? uh, I mean, um, I was reading, Gar, um, that when this show was getting ready to air in some places like Boston, um, that, that a lot of it, uh, local stations were kind of afraid to um, air it before, because even before the first episode ever aired, um, a lot of people, I guess on the description of a show, what it was supposed to be, they feared that it was going to like highlight hoodlum and criminal activity and, and it didn't end up being such a problem because, in fact, in Boston, they were were initially thinking of um, ban banning it from airing there, but um, they allowed it to air and they found out um, it was more like funny and joke stuff than, than really highlighting anything like criminal activity. And, and people, it became something that people loved, the show. Well, most people now, because it's so far removed, you know, many, 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 many yeah. decades later. Yeah. Um, you know, but you know, back in back in the uh, you know uh, mid seventies, you know, people today don't know um, that uh, segregation was uh, still going on in yeah, the yeah. Uh, mid seventies, where uh, you know um, you know there was a certain faction of our society that deemed that they would not allow their children to share. A classroom with uh, children of other color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was the thing. And that... you know, it's it's you know because yeah, you know, uh, the mid seventies. Uh, you know, for for people that are young today, the, uh, you know, the mid seventies. Oh my gosh, that's such a long time ago. Yeah, and yeah. for people like me, it's not that long ago. Sure, sure. And and when you look in the in the scheme. Of uh, of the chron uh, chronological order of of life, it's not that long ago. Yeah, and, I, and you and, make a you and, make a great and point. It's really yeah. kind of scary to think, you know, with uh, you know uh, that you know that it's not that long ago, you know that uh, that you know this this type of strife. Uh, was going on and was alive and well, and just like in in the seventies, uh, uh, you know, compared to nowadays, uh, it, this is the reason why you can't really take things from another time period and compare it to now. Sure, sure. Because because, because the entire uh, so sociological order at that time 
uh, was completely different. Oh, yeah. And to yeah. compare something that's completely different, the only way that you truly can compare it is to, uh, to point out how completely different it is. Sure, sure. You know, but, you know, uh, back in the, in the, in the 70s, also a woman could not have a credit card. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, that, at that time, you know, women will find this very offensive today. Yeah. Uh, but in the mid-70s, it was determined, because it was a male-dominated world back in those days, it was determined by the males that women were not responsible enough to be given the responsibility of having credit because uh, the male part of society at that time determined that women yeah, yeah. were equal to children. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. To give a woman a credit card would be like giving a credit card to a child. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's very, very yeah. offensive. Oh, yeah. But this is the society that uh, that was going on in Brooklyn at that time. Yeah, I, I, you know, and Gar, you make, you make a couple of great points there. I, I do believe, like, back in the 70s when this first aired, you're, you're so right that um, there were places in the United States where segregation was still taking place it was not as obvious and what i mean there, there there were people back then where the good portion of americans are probably under the impression that that was no longer taking place in the united states but but in certain certain places in the united states it was it was well, a well-kept secret well hidden and, and if anything well, like that well, was to, to put, yeah to put it to put it more clearly about half of the country there you, uh, yeah there you go and it's not just certain places. It's yeah. literally half the country yeah, I, I, is yeah. still having that strong uh, stance. And, uh, and and so, you know, that's that's another part of the time machine is is uh, pointing the you know, because I, I personally don't want to have any part of any political discussion. No, but this was uh, a state of the world. The state uh, of the world. Sociological because uh, because um, pop culture is tied into sociological changes. Yeah, that's the reason why I pointed out. Yeah, yeah, and you know another thing we brought up in a couple of the past episodes. Um, a great example of that is, I mean, um, like when we did our episode earlier this year on "I Love Lucy," it was a three-part episode on because um, we we'd also did an episode um, then on um, Lucy Ball. We found out had a radio show called "My Favorite Husband" that. Neither you or I were aware of before we did the research for that show. And come to find out, not only is that was it the success of that radio show that launched I Love Lucy, which was based, loosely based on the radio show, uh, you even look at the fact that Lucille Ball was the star of that radio show, and yet the title for it was My Favorite Husband. You, you would think it'd be like maybe My Favorite Wife or something since it was based around Lucille Ball as the star. But, but back in those days, which I think when the radio show premiered was like in the early 50s, um, you could not have like, um, it, it was not believed that you could have a woman that was like outshining the, the, the man star, if you know what I mean. Well, not only that, uh, not only was she the star of that radio show, yeah. uh, but uh, the male counterpart of that radio show was getting paid a lot more money, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was being paid. Yeah. So she is literally the star of the show, carrying the show. The reason why the show is so popular is because of her. Yet, <laughs> yeah. there's, here are those measuring sticks of sociological uh, inequalities. Yeah, yeah. Um, that you know, it you know, it was. You know, fine and dandy for her to be paid cons not a little bit less, considerably less. And yet she had the starring leading role, but not paid like it, you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, yeah. But we're, 
are, you know, I mean, you know, this, you know, these are the sociological things that are, you know, we're pointing out from this time period yeah. uh, because they really tie into the popularity of the show Welcome Back, Cotter. Sure, sure. Uh, because, because, uh, you know, the the uh, the whole reason why Welcome Back, Cotter was so popular was because of the. Uh, where it sat in all of these sociological things that were going on at that time, yeah. you know, um, you know, the age group that really embraced Welcome Back Carter was a very, very young age group. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, Gar, um, I th what's interesting about Welcome Back Carter is people look at that show now and, and they point out one of the things they point out immediately is. Um, you know, forget about how funny it was for a minute, is, oh, l look at the cast, how racially diverse it was. Now, the interesting thing about it, I don't think um, when, when uh, Gabe Kaplan and Alan Sachs, who, these are the guys that pr uh, created the show together, um, when they sat down and created the uh, show, I don't think um, they had even had that in mind, oh, let's have a racially diverse cast, because simply it was based on uh, Gabe Kaplan's um, stand-up comedy routine, partially, and the other part was, it was based on a lot of people that he grew up in Brooklyn, New York, um, and, and the high school that they show uh, apparently in the opening of the show is a very high school that he went to in Brooklyn that the show is based off of, and those characters, um, namely the Sweat Hogs, are um, based off of um, uh, uh, kids that he went to school with, you know, uh, in high school and grew up with. So um, again, that's just kind of this guy kind of um, basing this show on his life story, if you will. Well, and, and, and you know, it, it, in the eighties, it became very commonplace yeah. for uh, comedians to be offered a TV show, uh, you know, uh, because of the popularity of their stand-up comedy. Yeah. And it really, really became super popular back in the nineties. Yeah. You know, where it, you know it, it just became this thing. You know, where you know comedians thought, well, I just fly to L.A. and as soon as I get off the airplane, I'll sign a contract to do a TV show. I mean, you yeah. know, it, it was just very commonplace uh, for TV shows to be offered to stand-up comedians. But Welcome Back, Carter, uh, really. Uh, allowed for the uh, the people that you know keep track of the success of these shows to uh, to notice you know this phenomenon that was occurring on his show, and, which later became a metric that they would base success of TV shows on. Yeah, and and and, and um, let's look at this fact. You know, another such show that was on around the same time was Sanford and Senna, and of course, you make a great point, in that Red Fox, you know, he was also a stand-up comedian. I mean, he was he was playing club, stand-up comedy clubs for, for years before um, there was ever a Sanford and Son uh, show on TV, and it was from his years of playing the uh, comedy circuit that, that helped land him a role. Now, you look at him, and you look at somebody like Gabe Kaplan, they could not be any more... Um, two different types of comedians, you know, um, in, in their comedy style. And yet, um, look at, you know, both those guys got their own show and look at what, um, you know, all these years later, people are still talking about, um, you know, like Red Fox, um, Gabe Kaplan. Um, we could we could talk about, um, you know, Jimmy Walker from Good Times. He was also, you know, on the TV at that time, um, getting his start in the clubs as well. Well, it, it, it's, it's just kind of unique what Welcome Back Carter was actually achieving at that time. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, where it affected the industry, you know, later on. Yeah. You know, and, and the racial diversity, I, I don't think that it was a conscious thing. Neither do you know, I. I think, Neither do I. I think that the characters were based on the racial diversity that was going on in Brooklyn at that, you know, at the time yeah. when Gabe Kaplan was was growing up and 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 uh, developing his comedy on on these characters. In fact, I, I was I was reading um, that before there was ever a Welcome Back Cotter, he had appeared um, five different times on the Tonight Show. That's where people like really started to see him for the first time. Well, I think I think that if they would have purposely you know, say, say uh, you know, when they're, you know, thinking about developing the show, if they would have uh, 
uh, you know, consciously, well, okay, let's let's uh, interject racial diversity <laughs> to the, uh, to the yeah, cast. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, I think, yeah. I think the American public would have would have recognized that as disingenuous. Sure, sure. And and probably rejected it, but because they they did it in a way that was not disingenuous, it was it was based on actual real people, you know, that happened to have this racial diversity. I think I think that's that has a lot to do with the reason why the public, uh, you know, embraced it. You know, it, it's just this, it, you know, this thing that, you know, the public recognized it as genuine. Yeah, you're so, you're so right, Gar. And I mean, they, they, um, this show was very much scripted like a lot of TV shows are, but uh, you're so right in that um, these were not made up characters necessarily that, um, you know, Gabe Kaplan just created off the top of his head. These are people that he grew up with. I mean, I mean, he gave them different names, obviously, but um, they were based on actual people he knew. So, so um, when when they're recording the episodes, you know, and he's playing the part of a teacher, Gabe Cotter, um, he's able to kind of relate to these people that are in the scenes with him. For a simple fact, these are based on people he actually grew up with. You know, they weren't ma- they weren't made up characters. Well, and and a lot of people, you know, unless you watched the show back in those days or or, or did watch the show, uh, uh, you know, during uh, the first run of the show back in the 70s, uh, the Horshack character was extremely popular and got a lot of the funniest lines. Yeah, yeah, just just to to go go there, yeah. Just, and, yeah. and you know because because all these years later ev- all ev- everybody remembers is the breakout star uh, from the show was uh, John Travolta sure sure you know you know because I mean he you know uh, he has had the uh, the, Biggest, the largest yeah. body of work yeah. uh, that he's been able to achieve. Uh, you know, out of everybody from the entire cast. Sure, sure. You know, but, you know, everybody recognized him, uh, you know, but in in truth, when the actual show was being aired, the Horseshack character was really, really super popular. Yeah, yeah, let, let me let me go there for a minute, uh, Gar, because, um, ooh, Mr. Kata, Mr. Kata, ooh, ooh, ooh. I got a question. Okay, um, that's what people kind of remember for Shaq character. That that became kind of um, you know, like like on, on Good Times, uh, Jimmy Walker and his Dino Might. That, that became his yeah, it was his catchphrase. catchphrase. And and whenever you think of Arnold Horshack, you think about that. Let's talk about the character of Arnold Horshack since you brought him. He was kind of this little kind of ner- very intelligent yet kind of nerdy type, the class clown that maybe the kid that all the other the kid that got to hang out with the cool kids that a lot of people other the people other kids would pick on and, and these cool kids that he was hanging out with if anybody would mess with their buddy arnold uh, they'd have to you know they take care of it well you know it, 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 he was really really funny and i yeah. just remember getting a lot of laughs sure. from his character and, and and as great as john travolta was um, in, in his part of, of Vinnie Barbarino, um, and he was def- definitely like the star of a show. It was like um, when talking about the students, it was those four guys together. Um, you know, it, well, it was true well, sense of an ensemble but cast. At the same time, you have to you have to also look at this is 1975, yeah. and John Travolta. He was he was really never recognized as super funny in the show. No, it was his power. As, yeah, you know, as this, you know, the girls just gravitated towards him. Yeah, you know, just you know, I I cannot stress how every girl at home back in 1975 had the hugest crush on John Travolta at that time. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, and, and, you know, that's back in the day when they had those, like, 16 magazines and, uh, and you know, who was the latest and, pop culture icon. he was a regular 
on and, all of those magazines. Yeah. The most popular magazine of that time for teenage girls was Sixteen magazine. Yeah, and and that just was yeah. the most popular one of them all. Even though there was there was just a whole slew of them, but Sixteen magazine was the most popular one, and John Travolta was like on the cover, like. All the time. And, and how many of those teenage girls had his poster and his photos all plastered all over their, their bedroom wall, you know? <laughs> yeah, he was on the wall Heart throb. with Mark Lindsay and yeah. Bobby Sherman. Lace Garrett. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, these are all those people that were the posters on girls' walls back in the mid-70s. Leif Garrett, Peter Frampton, all those guys, you know. Um, and just to give people, again, a time frame of when we're talking, um, Welcome Back, Cotter was an American TV sitcom that aired on ABC from September 9th, 1975 to May 17th, 1979. The show was on for four seasons and, and a total of 95 episodes, Gar. So... Um, Again, um, it didn't have a huge run, um, but 95 episodes, but long enough, I think, to make um, a lasting impression. Now, I got to tell you, one of um, my favorite aspects of a show, of course, was the title character, Mr. Carter. I always used to laugh at his jokes. I mean, I, the thing I always remember about watching the show was thinking, man, he is such a cool teacher. I wish I had a teacher like that. <laughs> Everybody does. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then and then just think about his wife. I mean, kids kids like their love their teacher so much that they're always just popping up at the house. I mean, his poor wife. Could you imagine? <laughs> well, you know, you just brought up something yeah. because that you know, I mean, that is so politically incorrect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. But just think about it. It you know, it was like something that was a subject matter yeah. that really was, everybody was naive about that subject matter, about students yeah, showing up at the teacher's house. Showing up at the home of a teacher. Yeah, yeah. That is just like, you know, like, oh my God, it, it is just so wrong. I think standards. I think part of it too, Gar. Let's be let's be honest. Is um, the innocence, of you will, of the 1970s, and what I mean by that is is you're well aware there was plenty of crime going on at the time. But I think a lot of people back then were naive. I mean, I remember people not having as much fear about letting their kids go out, you know, past a certain time. Uh, being, being a little, the world was a little more uh, trusting, I think, back then than they are today. You know, the world was a dangerous play, place back in those days, too. Oh, sure, it sure. It just wasn't it's as bad. dangerous yeah. as it is yeah. today. Yeah, You know what I mean? It, 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 you, you can't sit, you know what I mean? There there was the element of, of danger sure, of, sure. of all of all of these things that were going on at that time. You know, uh, you know back then. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the mid seventies, uh, you could get get pulled over for drunk driving. Yeah, yeah. And not get arrested. Yeah. And and not even get a ticket. Back in the seventies. Get off with a warning. Yes, yes. You know, you get a warning. And nowadays, you know, all they have to do is smell alcohol in your breath, and you're going to jail. And your car's getting towed. Yeah, to impound. And <laughs> your life is going to get turned upside down because the the very least you're going to wind up paying is about ten thousand dollars. I'm sure it's higher than that now. Sure, sure. And back in the mid seventies, you know, there were, you know, it was a completely different world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, another thing about Welcome Back. Cotter, um, specifically Mr. Cotter, the teacher, uh, that I don't know a lot of people are aware of, that apparently uh, um, part of the story was that, that uh, Mr. Cotter uh, graduated from the same high school, and then years later, you know, he goes to college, becomes a teacher, and he comes back to his alma mater where he graduated from, and when he comes back, um, the, 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 it's the same vice principal from when he used to go to school, and he's like, oh, goddamn, Cotter, what are you doing here? I got a job, Mr. Woodman. And, and so there's that rivalry between the vice principal and Mr. Cotter from the day he becomes a teacher. He goes back, and, and there's this um, such this rivalry or dislike of, um, 
of Gabe Cotter, but the vice principal, Mr. Woodman, gives him he gives him the class of, no, of students that nobody else, a, a classroom full of low lights, the students that nobody else that the school wants to teach. And, and, and you know those classes did exist. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you know, uh, at that time, uh, you know, it's just. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you just wish that the people that were in the class were as lovable as the cast yeah, of Welcome yeah. Back, Connor. Yeah. You know, because, uh, you know, uh, most of the time, you know, if you were in one of those classes, you were basically surrounded uh, by a bunch of other uh, fellow idiots, in- yeah. incorrigibles, you know, and, and, uh, and, and the reality of that is, is uh, that it's just a way of, of uh, you know, by, by putting uh, the, the, the people that uh, don't excel in class together, in a class full of non-excellers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, th- and thinking that you're doing something good, you know, that, that you're creating a fertile environment for learning by doing something like that yeah. <laughs> is really not exactly very intelligent. Yeah, yeah, that shows your lack of intelligence, if you will. And um, and you know, another aspect of the show I want to get your opinion on, Gar, is talking about uh, Gabe Kaplan as a comedian. Uh, do you remember at the beginning of each show, it, it opened up with a shot of him and his wife in the apartment, and it usually be, started off with him telling his wife some corny story about let me did i ever tell you a story about my crazy uncle uh, albert or whatever and, and then he goes into the story and then you know it takes a couple seconds telling the story and then it, it breaks into the opening theme and the show starts well you know it, it, it's it all encompasses that time period yeah yeah you know that time period and that time period in new york and and for me you know who grew up in southern california you know, and and just to me, New York has always, uh, you know, felt like this foreign country to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I've never been to New York, and I would I would just absolutely love to be able to uh, get a gig in New York and be able to travel to New York, so so I could, you know, I could like take it all in, you know. Uh, but you know, it it it. it the way that the rest of us had to visit New York, yeah, yeah, was through shows like this. Yeah, in fact, you know, if you if you look at the opening, it's very interesting because it, it kind of like I, even um, in prepping for a show today, I, I looked at some old episodes and I was um, noticing the opening. It kind of shows you like yeah, this this kind of New York uh, borough where the school is or whatever is supposed to take place, and um, it, it like it looks like where a bunch of um, hoodlums are, you know. Um, like I don't know that I'd want to go there, but it definitely looks New Yorkish. And and the thing about it is, I think there's always that rivalry, like you're talking about East Coast versus West Coast. So there is that. Well, you know, and and, and there's always going to be yeah. a East Coast versus West West Coast. You know, and uh, you know, but you know, the truth of the matter is, is is you know, when you when you when you do that. You're basically taking old school and pitting it against new school yeah. because, because uh, you know, uh, East Coast is old school. Yeah, but but I, I think I think that opening of the show, um, as far as the scenery and, and, and what what they were showing in the, um, I love the fact to find out that that was the actual school that that everything is based on and that, that he went to. So that that, that makes it a, a real cool. Um, opening and, and what I also remember from that opening is it's kind of like anytime you watch it, it's like okay this isn't like this isn't like a, a story based around your everyday high school this is like a high school you've never seen before so get ready well also in those opening credits you get to see what Bru- Brooklyn used to, to look, look like. like yeah 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 so even going back and and watching the show when you you know, uh, you know, when you see those opening credits, there's a lot of stuff that you're going to see in those opening credits that don't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So true. Including that sign, Welcome to Brooklyn. Wow, wow. 
You know that, that I think that that sign is in a museum now. I was going to say, can you imagine? And, and, and if not in a museum, could you ma imagine if they auctioned that sign off somewhere? How much somebody would probably pay for it? Because well, it was... yeah, because I mean, you're talking about a sign that you, you know you really can't appraise it because the appraisal is based on passion. Sure, sure. And again, you know, Gar, um, as I sit here and we're talking, another thing popped in my head is, you know, TV shows from that time, let's be honest, most of them were very family-oriented. Now, maybe the family at dinner time would get get together and watch Welcome Back, Cotter, but the show itself wasn't very family-oriented, if you think about it. Okay, but the family they, that kind of is shown on the show is uh, Mr. Cotter and his wife, and eventually they have, they have two, uh, you know, twin baby daughters. Uh, but that's the family, but the kids that are in the... Um, featured throughout the show, um, you get a sense that you know, none of their families are ever really shown or talking about. You're, they, they come from families, but kind of um, where maybe they didn't get the attention that they that they should have. You know what I mean? Well, you know, I, I, I remember you get a little bit of snippets of the personal lives of the student characters. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's not good. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's always kind of dark. But it really does, that aspect of the show really does mirror Real life. Know, the reason why a lot of these kids wind up in these classes uh, uh, is because of the environment that they actually grow up in in home at home. In fact, you know, you watch a, not yeah. a good environment. You watch and, a lot of the episodes, and and even th through many of these episodes, the, the wife, you know, um, Julie Cotter, is like always asking the why are you guys always hanging out over here? Why are you always coming over? And, and it gets it makes the point of. Um, if you had the family environment that these characters supposedly came from, you could see why they'd want to get away. Oh, yeah, we want to come see you, Mr. Cotter. You know, you guys always, we love what you guys have for dinner and stuff. You guys are cool to hang out with. You could kind of get that vibe. Well, and also it brings truth to uh, you can grow up in these dark environments and still turn out a good person. Sure, sure. And, 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 you know, another another um, thing I took notice of about this show was um, they, they did a great job throughout the history of a show of using comedy to kind of um, talk about these some of these subjects. For example, I was watching one episode where the character Juan Epstein, he, he comes in the class, you know, goofing around one day, and Mr. Cotter hasn't quite come in the classroom yet, and they're kind of goofing around for class. He's got, like, a fake mustache. He starts to get up in front of a room for, uh, acting like he's... Mr. Cotter, and he's, he's doing this. He's got like a fake kind of a mustache. And um, Mr. Cotter walks in and kind of sees what he's doing, and, and then just laughter breaks out. But, you know, that was a kind of like a classroom this was where these kids could go and they could kind of um, feel free to just joke around or be themselves, if you will. Yeah, it was a bond between the students and the teacher. And, and those bonds happened naturally you know, in, 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 in real schools and, and things like that yeah. you know so so there was there was a lot of things that the younger kids that were going to school could relate to when they were watching the show and and, and what, what what was really um apparent to me watching a lot of these episodes was that like um the racial diversity didn't matter all that much what i mean is they didn't make a big point like have you know maybe an episode where Freddie Boom Boom tells Mr. Cotter that you don't understand what it's like to be black. You know they they still went to him for advice. They they still um, looked up to him. You know um, it, it, it it I think did a great job in making the point that you know people from different backgrounds, people from different races, they can come together. They can um, be there for one another. They can help one another out. You know. Well, you know they you know. It, John Travolta went on to, like, major star. Sure. And Gabe Kaplan, you know, went a completely different route. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that, that the show really didn't last that long. And, and I think the reason being is I don't think that Gabe Kaplan uh, really uh, coveted the... Uh, the acting 
uh, way to make a living. I don't, I don't, you know, a lot of actors and actresses, you know, actors and actresses, and, you know, this, this is a correlation with musicians too. You don't want to make waves because you don't want to uh, stifle other opportunities that could come around the corner. Sure, sure. And, and so, so you're always on good behavior and you're always trying to make sure that your relations with the people around you that you're working with are good relations because you want to continue the, uh, the train keep, you know, keep on rolling. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think that Gabe Kaplan looked at it that way. You know, I think I think he looked at it like, well, okay, you can get, you know, if you cancel the show, it's not that big a deal to me. Yeah, see, you yeah. Know? I think I, yeah. honestly, I think that was his attitude, and I have a feeling that that had a lot to do with the reason why the show uh, didn't last that long because. Uh, you know, it, it was a very impactful show. That's the reason why it's part of the time machine. Oh, yeah. But, but it was a very impactful show that was very short-lived. No doubt. And Well, I, I was reading part of why he claims that he thinks um, the show lasted only, um, you know, four seasons. He says there's a couple of reasons. He said when we started the show, um, the, the ones that played the four main, um, you know, uh, Sweat Hog students... Um, they were like in their early twenties, and he says by the time, you know, we, we get into the fourth season, you know, they're they're in their mid twenties, and he says so. If part of his problem was, how do you carry a show four years, you know, make it believable that these kids are still in high school when they're in their mid twenties? He said, you know, so that was part of a that was part of an issue with him. And and rightly so, you know, I mean, because you know the. I think the viewing public was was actually seeing, you know, the aging happening, you know, at, yeah. at the time, and and the believability that they're still in high school was, you know, really starting to wane at that time. But you know, in truth, you know, the you know, uh, the, the the show really only lasted three and a half seasons. And you know why that is? Because the fourth season was really a hodgepodge. Yeah, because by the third season, that is where um, John Travolta, you know, starts breaking out in these huge movies such as, you know, Grease and Saturday Night Fever. And, um, and you know, eventually he becomes so popular that he ends up leaving the show. And see, right there, okay, how they have him leave the show, I mean, they could have done it in a number of ways, but they decide Vinny Barbarino is going to all of a sudden... Um, after goofing off for, in high school for the first, you know, two and a half years, he's going to drop out of high school and, and go become a nurse or something or be an orderly in a hospital. Um, and so that was kind of a, to me anyways, kind of a corny story, but um, it was an easy way, I guess, to get him off the show. And then from time to time, he would make, like, guest appearances. But um, I think, and, and it's not just because it was based on, um, on, on John Travolta, but I think one of the, since... You know, when the one of the main four characters leaves, as far as the Sweat Hogs, it wasn't the same show. They tried to bring this other kind of, almost the opposite of what Vinnie Bob Reno was, this kind of blonde, intelligent guy, his name was Bo, tried to make him, um, you know, kind of take Vinnie's place, but um, it didn't seem like it was the same show. And then you had the other guys kind of doing their thing, but it was like... Um, if you carry on the three stooges with only two stooges, it's not quite the same thing. You know, it, you know the uh, <laughs> yeah. I, another catchphrase was "up your nose with the rubber." Hose. Okay, Gar, I know where you're going with this, but so, yes, yes, I love that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, you know, in doing the research, you know, I it was actually based on uh, the uh, the actual real person that uh, the character was based on, you know, and that you know he he actually used to say that kind of as his own catchphrase, you yeah. know, but it was up your hole with a mellow roll. Wow! Wow! And we don't know what a mellow role was, but it was actually a very popular 
ice cream treat back okay. in the uh, back in the fifties, and uh, up your hole, you know, always has the connotations of yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> up the other end, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. you know, so. So I, you know, I would imagine, you know, that is inappropriate, you know, for a uh, a prime time TV but show. But it's a great way of getting that in there, if you will, you know, without people really knowing what it is. Yeah, and and it, and it really, you know, up your nose with a rubber hose is is kind of cute, you know. What I mean, it's you know, but you know, uh, nowadays I I have to admit, you know, uh, you know, it would. It wasn't until the 80s, yeah. you know, that uh, cocaine started becoming really popular. I mean, it existed back in the 70s, but, but it wasn't, wasn't a, yeah, known about. It wasn't, you know, uh, you know, it was something that was kind of new, you know, amongst the, uh, the, you know, the the element of society that was the partiers. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, you know, so but but the explosion of popularity of cocaine was uh, the eighties, and of course, up your nose with a rubber hose had a new meaning. To, yeah, to me has more. I mean, now you know, in my mind, that's the visualization that pops in my head. Is this? It's a it's a cocaine reference uh, co- co- reference or connotation. But, and, yeah. and, and and it's farthest from the truth. It's really, uh, you know, something to do with uh, a catchphrase back. from the actual real character. Yeah, you know, Gar, um, I remember, and it, it, this is because it was a, a reference to Welcome Back, Hotter, you know, that catchphrase that he had. But I remember as a kid hearing people say that all the time, um, up your nose with rubber hose, and, and most people thought it was a cute saying, but um, it was also kind of very big at the time because... That was also around the same time as Good Times, and Jimmy Walker had his Dino Might. That's when people really started uh, kind of thinking up these catchphrases. And and I don't know that it was so thought up because it was based on this real character that gave Kaplan Noop. So it's it's based on some actual real person, which makes it that much um, you know cooler. Here's another thing I found about um, in, in speaking of Happy Days that. Um, when we did our episode on um, Happy Days, we we found out um, one of the other people to um, to audition for the role of Fonzie was Mickey Dolenz from A Monkey. But in doing the research for today's episode, I found out that John Travolta also um, got a call to audition for um, Fonzie. And part of the reason um, he didn't really do a good job auditioning, he said, is um, Fonzie was portrayed to him as kind of a um, le- leather-bound kind of hood thug type with blonde hair and he's like I really didn't want to have to dye my hair um, blonde but uh, so apparently John Travolta also um, after being on Welcome Back Cotter auditioned for well actually no it would have been before Welcome Back Cotter that was one of the first auditions he got was to um, audition for Fonzie could you man I, I could kind of see him maybe he's the only other one I could really kind of see as a Fonzie type other than Henry Winkler <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, of course, you know, many years later, you know, with uh, his success with Greece, yeah. you know, it's easy to visualize, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? You know, the, uh, you know, the, the two, you know, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I would imagine that, you know, if uh, Travolta did the character, it would have been completely, completely different. different. Yeah. In fact, you know, completely different. See, that's the thing about his character, Vinny Barbarino. Vinny was kind of his dumbed down. It's funny because he was the leader of the group, and he was probably the least intelligent of the entire uh, 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 Sweat Hog gang. Well, you know, uh, you know, he he was. I you know, I just keep going back, to, you know, because because um, John. Uh, I cannot stress how much of a heart throb he was. John Travolta was at that time. Yeah, My yeah. God, you know, it, 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 the only people that know now are the, the people... girls that used to have crushes on him back then. Oh, sure. <laughs> and let me it's just yeah. everybody's grandmother. <laughs> It's like so weird to think that you know, like you know, every 
everybody's, you know, everybody's grandmother was getting the thrill. Crush yeah. on John Travolta. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's so true. And let me ask you, Gar, um, did you get a chance to um, check out any of those clips I sent you yesterday? I, I, I did. Um, I, you know, the uh, the one that was the song. That's what, uh, for some reason, it, you know, I was trying to listen to it on my cell phone, but it wouldn't play. No okay. sound was coming out. Well, okay. So I, so I wound up watching it on uh, YouTube. YouTube on my computer. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm scratching my head as to why it made it all the way up to 91 on the Billboard charts. That's what I was laughing about. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not a... <laughs> I, the only reason in my mind that I can I can mentally digest as to why yeah. is because of the popularity of the show. Well, exactly. You know, in fact, Gar, um, that's specifically the clip I was asking uh, to get your response on because, like, so often when we do these shows, I had no idea that that song even existed. I knew nothing about it. I just typed in a search for Welcome Back, Cotter. That's one of the things that came up, and I thought you've got to be. I mean, I'm like, I got to hear this, and, and you're so right. It's kind of funny for what it was at the time. It's not a great song, but because of the popularity of that phrase and that show at the time, I thought I want to hear this. And, and and I think Gar, one day we got to do an episode on some of these novelty songs. I mean, w like when we did our episode on Batman, there, there were a couple of these novelty songs that Adam West and Burt Ward each did. I think Adam West did one called Miranda. It was kind of funny as hell to listen to. And I, um, but can you imagine the people like that have the, the, that that record somewhere? How cool that would be. And and like I agree with you, ninety three on the Billboard. When you think, I mean, ninety three isn't exactly number one, but at the same time, when you stop and think that it even got on the Billboard top one hundred chart, that top is 100. that's and, amazing. And, and being in the top one hundred is actually considered, you know, a, a major accomplishment. Day, yes, it's considered a major accomplishment. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, um, the other thing we not we need to talk about is um, "Welcome Back" um, was the theme song to "Welcome Back, Cotter," written by and recorded by former Love and Spoonful singer John Sebastian. And that song, this is interesting too, because I'm um, talking about the Billboard chart. It reached number one on the um, Billboard chart for um, one week in 1976, I think it said. And it reached number 93 on the country chart. John Sebastian had a long, hugely successful career as a musician I think he's in his early 80s now yeah. Before he, yeah long before he ever started doing theme songs for TV shows he was uh, you know um, he was the love and spoonful yeah the love and spoonful and and you know for the hippie crowd he played at Woodstock you know, as a solo artist and yes and it was you know he was extremely successful as a musical artist and you know his career his body of work is very impressive yeah which, you know when you look back now yeah. at the huge success that he had his body of work and and this is everything he accomplished before he started doing these theme songs for tv shows yeah and you know Gar, the but, thing is with but this to, but today yeah you know, it, it, it's, it, he's only remembered for his theme songs. Yeah, and, and, and that's very interesting because he had this huge success. Like I said, he had played Woodstock as a solo artist, which was in 1969. This show comes out, you know, a few years later, 1975. Has a huge hit with it. Now, you can go on YouTube. There's even a, a video of him performing this, and you can see how young he was at the time. Um, probably in his early 30s. 40s maybe early 40s at the oldest and um just him strumming his guitar singing the song and the thing was this song like i said became number one on the billboard chart first of all think about that not too many tv shows have a theme to hit number one on the billboard chart so that's quite an accomplishment for this guy and then this song became so popular gar not only did they shoot a um this music video that you can check it out on youtube i'm going to post it on the page 
we put the episode up next weekend. But he started going out and like performing on you know TV and different different events, performing this song. It became you know a huge hit. And like you said, in um, pop culture land, this is um, this is one of the most popular theme songs of all time. Yes, and, and, uh, and just to put it in perspective, when you mention the name John Sebastian, the first thing that pops in your head is welcome back. Yeah, yeah, and you know he, he, he... It's the first thing that pops in your head. Yeah, I heard him I heard him talking about the song. I saw an interview somewhere on YouTube, and he was talking about the fact that when he was hired to, to write the song... He said he wanted to come up with lyrics that kind of um, rhymed with Cotter, but he really couldn't. So that's why they changed the name to Welcome Back. He's like, I wanted yes, it to be a welcoming yes, song. Yes, yeah. yes. That song that he wrote for the theme song uh-huh. actually changed the name of the show. Yeah, yeah. And you know, another reason they call it Cotter, I was reading, because phonetically, that is how people would say the name like that are from Brooklyn because you know they're Brooklyn yes. accent. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And and I I never realized it until I read it. Yeah. You know, but but yes, if you actually grew up in Brooklyn, if if you were going to say the name Carter, yeah. That is exactly how you would pronounce it. Kata. Yeah, Kata. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and Mr. Kata. Yeah. You yeah, know? yeah. And, and that is so true. You know, so you know, it, you know, it's it's so weird how uh, the the accent of Brooklyn cha- it, it affected the cha- the spelling of the name. Yeah, the lyrics to the, and yeah. the actual uh, the actual uh, pronunciation of the name Carter actually affected how the you know how it was all going to go about. Yeah, and even how he wrote the song and the lyrics, and and, and like you yes, said, I couldn't I yes. couldn't think of anything to rhyme with Cotter, so I just kind of um, based it around you know things that or like making it a, kind of a welcoming song, um, and so so that's kind of um, it's kind of interesting. And it's a song that you know you never get tired. I mean, I, even watching the episodes and prepping for this last night, I was like, it's taking me back. I mean, I'm singing along as a, and what's interesting is. The, the theme, this theme kicks in either as the show is opening and also at, at the end, which you don't um, have too often, but it's kind of like uh, the show's rallying cry, if you will. It was just uh, a great way to start the show, and you, you start singing the song as it's ending, and you're like, oh, i got to wait till next week, man. <laughs> well, you know, it really captures the 70s, yeah. uh, and, and it really captures, uh, you know, what I envisioned the 70s in Brooklyn and you, or in yeah. New York. And before we close and, today... And yeah. for me, yeah. it is, it, to this day, it still remains that kind of reference that I always have in my mind. Yeah, and, and you know, and before we close the show today, Garb, the other thing is um, why it worked at the time. If you think there had never been a show before Welcome Back, Cotter, that was kind of focused on going to school and the classroom and stuff. And, and they did it in a, in a funny comic. Well, years later, like, um, ABC would try to repeat it with the head of the class, which starring Howard Hessman, who was Johnny Fever from WKRP. Um, but, uh, you know, it was kind of like a modern-day Welcome Back, Cotter. But, but again, like anything, when you try to repeat it, they had success with that, but it wasn't really like Welcome Back, Cotter. It kind of had a character of its own. Well, you know, WKRP was an extremely popular show back in the 70s, too. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and of course, a show like WKRP, it was totally geared towards, uh, you know, uh, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? As, as far as the demographics they were trying to appeal to, yeah, they were trying to appeal to that. AOR radio uh, listener and uh, you, uh, you, today people don't know what AOR uh, album oriented yeah album oriented rock yeah 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 and and that was the that was what the 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 acronym that was put on stations like KLOS KMET and all these other rock. 
uh, stations, you know, that were popular at the time, they were AOR radio stations, sure. album-oriented rock radio yeah. stations. And WKRP was totally marketed, you know, towards towards me as that listener. And then when you watched episodes, they actually had pieces of the popular music that was being played on the radio at that time sure sure you know so so you even got snippets of pink floyd or or or, uh uh queen you know or all these these bands that were popular during the 70s you know so you know i know we're getting a little bit off the rails all right wwkrp was also a very very popular tv show at that time oh yeah future episode of a time machine i think gar as we're sitting here but um maybe maybe so because howard hessman was a major star at that time johnny fever everybody knew who johnny and don't don't forget don't forget after um after WKRP came up there, he also had success on One Day at a Time. He also, after that, he went on to have a success with Head of the Class. That's the show I was talking about, but I think it was loosely based on Welcome, like, hey, let's make a modern day Welcome Back Cotter. I think it had a, a Head of the Class, had kind of a character, it became its own thing. It wasn't really, I didn't think of it as the next Welcome Back Cotter, but they think, hey, uh, we had success with this in the 70s, let's try to repeat it. You know, he was, Howard Hessman, we're, we're off the rails, but I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Howard Hessman, back in those days, was freaking Johnny Cool. There you go. And, 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 and no matter what he was on after that, I will always remember his, him as, as the doctor, Johnny Fever. <laughs> I almost said a curse word. There you go. F, F, yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and you know, Gar, um, we should also, before we wrap it up, mention the fact that some of the cast has since passed away. Now, of course, um, Ron Pahil, who played um, who played Arnold Horshack, he died, um, I think, in 2012. I was reading he had a he had a heart attack. He was like in his um, like late 40s, early 50s. So he had gray hair and he died relatively young. But he again, he is always going to be remembered as Arnold Horshack as he should be, um, and he never really had. Too much success after any time you'd see him do an interview, it'd be talking about Welcome Back Cotter or you know Arnold Horshack and 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 that, that's cool. And then like you said, John Travolta, he's had the biggest career out of everybody. Um, and then also the one that played um, Robert Hedges, I think his name was Juan Epstein. He he had a heart attack, I think the same year, 2012, and and, and he passed on. And Marcia Strassman, who played um, the role of Julie Cotter, the wife, um, she died a couple years back of. Um, Breast cancer, and as you mentioned, Gabe Kaplan has taken a very different um, turn in his career. He's not acting or even doing stand-up much these days. Since uh, Welcome Back, Cotter came out there, he he got involved with like professional um, poker playing, and some and some from time to time you'll see him on some of these professional um, poker tournaments, you know, on live TV. And so that's kind kind of the um, path his career has taken, and he's very interesting to look at. Like like all of us, he's gotten older. He does not have a beautiful afro. He's he's lost a lot of it. So looks very very different. But that's kind of where everybody's at. Well, he also went into financial investments and made a very very tidy fortune. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he used uh, I think like uh, two hundred thousand dollar winnings that he won from a poker tournament. Wow. And then parlayed that into financial investments in which he did very well with those investments, too. Well, very, very good for him, you know. And, and, you know, um, before we do wrap it up, Gar, I want to, because I can't believe that we spent the whole episode and we didn't really talk much about the character of Freddie Boom Boom Washington. I mean, I think he was the jock of the group. Can I interject? A lot of people don't know why he had the the nickname Boom Boom, but I do. Okay. Because I, I come from a bass player background. Yeah, yeah. And he was, you know, Boom Boom was because he actually used to play air guitar that he was a bass player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I read so that, that's and you know, that's how he got that. That's how he got that. And the other, the other clip I sent you, there was one of him, I guess, 
after Welcome Back, Hotter, he he tried to make some records and some music, and um, I don't know if he ever became. Well, he, hugely... I heard he did actually very well with a with a soul album uh -huh. that he came out with that you know it, it didn't go well like, top ten yeah, or anything but, yeah. like that, but it actually did well. Yeah, that's interesting. That's I was interesting to find that out, and then the, I found out some old clips from um, American Bandstand where some of the kids from um, Welcome Back, Hotter would like show up in the audience and they, they'd interview them. That, so, um, that, that was fun that you started seeing some of these people popped up. And the very last thing I want to talk about, because I think it's important to bring up, is um, the character of Juan Epstein. A big, a big part of the show was you'd always hear um, him, uh, these notes, Epstein, Epstein's mom. Um, what did you think of his character? You know, the one thing, <laughs> he was voted the most likely to take a life. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I you know, yeah. His, his fictional character yeah, 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 yeah. was voted that. Yeah. But that that was, I mean, that's pretty hardcore. Sure, sure. To think about that in a comedy TV show that's being shown in prime time, that your character was voted the most likely to take a life. Interesting, yeah. What, what, a, what, what, so, you know, that's really, it's I mean, kind of, you know, it, you know, it really kind of points out to the, you know the uh, the the behind the curtain darkness of, of the, the show, uh, yeah. the life of the care, the, the the behind the scenes lives of these characters on the show. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you know he he and also he uh, he based the stylings of his character on. Chico Marx. Interesting. Uh, which, which, um, when you look at him and you look at Chico Marx, they have physical similarities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And and then in reality, when you look at how he does his character, you can, you know, when he points that out, I could definitely see how he was basing that his character. character on Chico Marx. Wow, wow, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't so, aware of that. So that was a very interesting thing that he brought up when he was bringing up his uh, influences for the character. And, and you know, Gar, um, the final thing we're going to say um, on today's episode is, you know, John Travolta, like you said, he's had the most successful career. But, um, he's been so successful at this point in life that people forget, you know, he had like, a couple of bomb movies. I mean, probably the um, biggest bomb was like Urban Cowboy. And then his career at that point in the early 80s really started to go down. I don't think it was till around the time he did Pulp Fiction that his career got like a major kick in the ass. But you, you got to give the guy credit. He's been he's been doing this for that long. And, um, you know, set, since um, like Pulp Fiction, his career has only gone up. And I can't think of the last movie he's made, but at this point, you know, if he was to retire, you know, uh, he, he's made his mark, and, you know, he, he looks very different. He's, like, he's bald, you know, he doesn't have any hair. Uh, I don't know if he's shaved, but, you know, he's gone through a lot in his personal life. One of his, one of his sons had a seizure and died a few years ago. His teenage son, his wife died a few years ago of cancer. So he's, he's had, like, a career that was up and down, but I, I, I give it to him because he's still out there doing it, and, and he, he ha ever since he's had a comeback, it's been up, 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 up all the way. Well, a lot of people don't know that his wife that passed away recently, she was a major star Herself. back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, because, but because she married him, yeah, she, she just kind of like, you know, had went a family. into retirement. Yeah. You know, she just, you know, she, she didn't really care about, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal for to her. her. So yeah. she was fine with being the housewife. Yeah. But, but yeah, back in the 80s, she was a majorly popular actress. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, back back at that time. And Gar, it was it was fun looking back on Welcome Back Holiday. I, I always love these Sundays. Um, before we go, I want to just let people know, next time we do this in two weeks... Um, Gar and I had a great idea. We're going to, uh, next episode, episode number 51, we're going to do on Casey Kasem's Top 10, which was kind of, um, you know, a, a vid, a, a, like a video countdown they had on TV back in the, I remember watching it back in the day, being on Channel 5, right before like the Family Film Festival with Tom Hannon. So I can specifically have memories of watching that show as well. You know, back when they used to do it, it was the norm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't think 
twice uh, when it when it would pop on when he would pop on with his you know top ten. And you know it's funny because it was always there, and then just one day it wasn't. So we're going to talk about yeah. that now, Gar. If you could hang on for a minute, I'd like to talk you off air. <laughs> Take care, buddy. Chaotic Grips Magazine.